Hello, this presentation is going to be covering Chapter 1, EMS Systems. This first chapter in the book is just going to uh, give us a broad uh, description of the EMS system, uh, what your role in the EMS system is as an EMT, and it's going to discuss some of the other roles um, throughout the EMS system. This text is the primary resource for the EMT course. Um, there are multiple texts um, that uh, cover an EMT course. This is one of the more popular um, books that covers the course. This book has all the information that, that um, you, you need in the state of Ohio to become an EMT. Um, and all of these books are um, established and, and um, credentialed um, to have all of that information uh, located in them. So just be aware that this text uh, is one of many that cover the EMT course. Um, however, this one is comprehensive uh, for the state of Ohio. EMS is a system. You are uh, a piece of that system. You're going to become a piece of that system as an EMT. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit throughout this, uh, throughout this course. Um, chapter 1 discusses that the system's uh, key components. So we're going to talk about those key components of the system and how you fit into that system as an EMT. So let's talk about the course in and of itself. The EMS system uh, is a team of healthcare professionals. This includes um, firefighters, EMTs, paramedics, um, emergency medical responders, dispatchers, um, nurses, physicians, um, anyone that provides emergency care and support. The EMS system is governed by state laws. As you complete this course, you're eligible to either take um, the National Registry exam or your state certification exam in the state of Ohio. Uh, you will take the National Registry exam. So the state of Ohio uh, uses the National Registry exam as our certification testing. So essentially how this works is uh, you will go through this entire course, 176 hours of, of course material. Um, at the end of that course, at the end of this course, um, you will uh, take a, a written and a, a practical test. That's for the course. After that practical test and the written test is passed, then you will be eligible to take the National Registry, uh, the National Registry EMT exam, cognitive exam. And this is a computer-based test uh, that you will take off-site. You schedule this on your own time um, after the course is finished. And that's essentially the test that you need to pass in order to become an EMT. So the whole point of this course is to get you ready for that National Registry test. Obviously also to, to you know, get you prepared to, to work as an EMT. Um, but the goal here is to, uh, to pass that National Registry test so you can become certified in the state of Ohio. Uh, it's, it's, the test is very similar um, uh, in structure to, um, to like, if you're familiar with nursing, to like an NCLEX, or if you were a lawyer, it would be like the bar exam. It's the big certification test that, that, uh, that the state uses to ensure that you're competent enough to become an EMT. Uh, most states, Ohio included, have four training uh, levels at the, of, of EMTs in, in the EMS system. Um, the first level being EMR, or Emergency Medical Responder. The second level, which is what you're taking a course um, in, what most people start out as is the EMT level. Um, the EMR level is, is essentially used for um, but, you know, folks in rural areas or volunteers or people that work in large factories that want to be um, kind of a first responder type uh, position. Um, the EMT level is the first position that we see uh, folks who, who, you know, actually have the ability to get a job as an EMT, so solely as an EMT. Um, there's not very many folks who can get a job solely as an, as an emergency medical responder. So usually that level is skipped. Um, and people start directly off with the EMT course, which is what you're doing here today. <clears throat> After that, we have the AEMT, which is advanced EMT, and then the paramedic level, which is the highest level of pre-hospital uh, EMS uh, care in the state of Ohio. So again, talking EMRs, uh, emergency medical responders, um, they have a very basic training. This is just um, kind of an advanced first aid. Um, it provides basic care before an ambulance with higher trained professionals arrives. Um, they may assist in the ambulance, um, but generally they're, they're um, used as a, as a uh, first responder in the event that the ambulance is, is taking a little bit longer to arrive. An EMT has training in basic life support, including automated external defibrillation, um, airway adjuncts, uh, assisting patients with certain medications. And you're certainly going to um, have a lot of information about all of those things as we go throughout this course. 
an advanced EMT, so the next level past beyond what you're being trained to here in this course. An advanced EMT has training in specific aspects of advanced life support, including intravenous therapy, starting IVs, and administering a limited number of emergency medications um, through those I, I, uh, excuse me through those IVs. Now, paramedic, being the highest level, has extensive uh, advanced life support training, including the ability to um, intubate someone endotracheally, so an endotracheal intubation, uh, emergency pharmacology, so they have got a wide range of medications that they can administer and a wide range of, of methods to administer those medications through IM injections, IV, intravenous, intraosseous, through, the, um, through a, uh, an IO drill through the bone. Uh, cardiac monitoring, other advanced assessment and treatment skills. So the EMT course includes four learning activities, uh, reading assignments, lecture presentations, and classroom discussions. Uh, so essentially, to succeed in this course, you must read this book. We simply don't have the time, and 176 hours is not nearly enough time, um, to go through every single element of this book. Um, so it's imperative that you read every chapter of the book. My recommendation is to read these chapters prior to uh, coming to class or prior to watching these lectures online. Um, you know, reading assignments are important. It's important for you to, to gain that breadth of knowledge um, prior to coming to the lecture presentations so that when you get to the lecture presentation, uh, the instructor can cover the high points and then answer any questions that you may have based on those reading assignments that you've done. There's also going to be demonstrations. We're going to be demonstrating different skills, different equipment that we may use. Um, there's going to be some skill sheets that you're going to be covered. Um, and then there's going to be case presentations and scenarios, which you're going to, um, uh, you're going to do at, at least towards the beginning of class. We'll do uh, some case studies, some case presentations. Um, and then we'll continue those throughout um, throughout the course. And those just kind of help to um, give you a, a more well-rounded view of, of the stuff that you're reading about in class. All right, so as far as EMT training goes, uh, EMTs are the backbone of the EMS system in, in, in the United States, and I would include EMTs, uh, advanced EMTs, paramedics. Um, EMTs provide emergency care to um, sick and injured um, patients. Some patients are in life-threatening situations. Um, other patients only require supportive care. So not every run that you're going to go on, not every um, time that someone calls 911 is not necessarily a life-threatening emergency. Um, sometimes they just need supportive care. So, uh, you know, you're going to have a good mix of those, of, of those uh, two, two types of runs throughout, throughout your career. Some of the subjects that we're going to discuss in the text include um, the scene size up. The scene size up is um, upon your arrival at the scene, <clears throat> excuse me, and even before your arrival. Um, these are all the things that are going through your head, um, generally to ensure your safety. So your safety is priority. That's the first thing that you have to be thinking about any run that you go on uh, in, in EMS. So that's, part, that's a big part of the scene size up is ensuring your safety. That's the first priority. Um, additionally, the scene size up is, is, uh, is where you're going to gain a, a general impression of the event that's going on. It's where you're going to look at the big picture and, and get a, get a, uh, a feeling for, uh, what type of run you're going on. Is there multiple patients? Um, is this some sort of hazmat incident? Is there a fire? Has it been an auto accident? Um, is this patient, you know, just having some sort of medical complaint? That's all part of that scene size up. After that, we go into a patient assessment where um, you're now entering into the patient's residence or, or coming in contact with the patient, and you're going to start to ask them questions. And the patient assessment um, is something that we're going to spend a, a decent amount of time on throughout the course, is, is getting you comfortable talking with your patients, asking them questions, and trying to figure out what's wrong with them. After that, after we know what's wrong with them, we can treat them. So going to learn a, a wide array, a array of, uh, of different treatment modalities, different treatment options that you have uh, as an EMT. Um, certainly as you continue on in your training, if you become an advanced EMT or a paramedic, those treatment options get, get larger, wider, more in quantity. Um, but at the EMT level, we'll, we'll, we'll cover all of the different treatment options that you have uh, based on your patient assessment. After that, we're going to, you know, we're going to discuss packaging, talking about getting this patient put onto the, onto the cot, get them into the ambulance, uh, and, and, and move them on to the hospital. 
we're certainly also going to discuss EMS as a career. So uh, as you as you move forward, if this is something that you want to do um, on a volunteer basis or as a hobby or certainly as a career, um, we're going to discuss your options and, and what that looks like uh, moving forward. All right, so we're going to briefly just cover the history of EMS. And again, this is a section where um, there's a lot more information in the book, so feel free to continue your reading in the book uh, about the history of EMS. It is good um, to know where all this started, right? The origins of EMS, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in like many other things, uh, certainly in public safety, uh, came from uh, conflicts. World War One, World War Two, um, the Korean conflict. This is this. These are some of the origins of EMS. And this was all very dynamic um, towards the beginning. Uh, beginning phases of this, you know, as, as EMS started to become a thing in the United States, we were learning a lot of things throughout World War One, World War Two, and then in the Korean conflict. Um, but World War One is, is essentially where all this started, and that was where where there were volunteer ambulances uh, established. Right, uh, people were were being taken out of the conflict with by uh, by essentially medics, what would become medics. Uh, World War Two is where. Uh, we started to provide some field care, so field hospitals um, treating these patients. We're not just leaving them to die. You know, if someone was was injured somehow, uh, you know, from from uh, from one of these conflicts, <clears throat> you know, in the past they may have just been considered a casualty and left to die. Uh, field care became a became more popular in World War II. We were actually treating these folks, saving their lives. Um, as far as transportation, transporting field medics and rapid helicopter evacuations became very popular in the Korean conflict. Obviously, we've continued that on uh, to today. Um, EMS really started for the for the civilian world in the United States in 1966, um, based on the uh, publishing of what's known as the White Paper, um, and that's called uh, the Accidental Death and Disability: The Neglected Disease of Modern uh, Society. That white paper uh, essentially established emergency medical services in the United States. Um, so prior to that, um, prior to this white paper coming out, uh, EMS was very, very sporadic, if, if, if even available in most, most locations. Um, the early uh, 70s, um, the Department of Transportation published the first EMT training curriculum. Um, so 1966 was when Essentially, EMS was established by the white papers. It wasn't until the early 70s to when a, a training curriculum even came out. If you look at some of the history of these things, and, and it's kind of interesting if you, if you get a hold of a really old textbook or really old uh, books related to EMS or EMT training, you know, very rudimentary, um, you know, not very comprehensive. We've come a long way since, since the 70s. 1971, um, uh, AAOS published the Orange Book. And that is the descendant of the textbook that you um, are actually reading about, uh, or excuse me, actually reading today. So some national, uh, some national standardization efforts um, throughout time in the 70s. I mentioned the Department of Transportation created that national standard curriculum and that national training curriculum. So 1970s essentially established the guidelines, the book for what it takes and what it means to be an EMT. In the 1980s, they started to create some advanced levels of EMT. That's where you see advanced EMTs and paramedics. Uh, and then in 1990, the uh, NHTSA uh, created the EMS agenda for the future. And this was basically laying out the plans for um, what EMS looks like um, in today's world, really, in the, in the you know, early 2000s, uh, up until now, up until today. So some different um, levels of training, federal level uh, would be the national EMS scope of practice model. So essentially the way that the way that EMS training works and the way that our, 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 um, our procedures, our policies, the way we treat people, um, there's three different levels and, and the federal level, state level and local level. Federal level is um, the, the essentially, you know, the umbrella over top of all of EMS. This is the national scope of practice model. So this provides guidelines for all EMTs across the entire country. Um, the state level then has their own laws that regulate EMS operations based on their particular state. So every state does EMS a little bit differently, but again, we all follow, we all fall underneath this federal umbrella, which is the national EMS scope of practice. 
Um, so the state level is, uh, you know, each state is slightly different in how they regulate those particular EMS operations. And that's imperative because each state has different, um, you know, there's, there's different possibilities, different, uh, you know, geography layouts, the location of hospitals. So different states do things a little bit differently. Ohio um, does something, you know, does things differently, I'm sure, than, uh, you know, than, than uh, uh, a state, you know, that has a lot more rural areas. You know, you go out west and you see some of these uh, states that have, you know, hundreds of miles between hospitals, they have to operate a little bit differently. So that's why each state has their own laws regulating EMS operations. And then we have the local level. The local level is, is um, your particular um, company that you work for, the particular municipality that you work for, if you work for a city, um, if you work for a private ambulance company. Um, these companies, these cities, municipalities, they have their own policies and procedures. Again, they fall under the umbrellas of the federal level and the state level, but they can then tweak things um, to fit their local model. This is where we have a medical director, and the medical director provides oversight and support. So every EMS agency, um, this school included, uh, has a medical director. So whether it's a training program, whether it's a private ambulance company, whether it's a city or municipality, fire-based EMS, they, every, every um, group, every EMS entity has a medical director. And the medical director is, a, in a, is an emergency, uh, emergency room physician or a physician that has specialized training in emergency medical care. And that medical director provides oversight and support. So they provide um, a curriculum, essentially a, a, a protocol. And we'll talk about all those things as we go um, throughout this uh, throughout this chapter. So if you, if you look at this, these different levels of training here and, and, and uh, how they kind of overlap in the national uh, EMS scope of practice model is a theoretical foundation. So that's, again, the umbrella. That's the basis for everything that we do. The state EMS office, they really control administration, regulatory roles. So they, they put out some, some regulations, legislative, meaning they uh, put out the laws that, that we have to follow. And then the medical director or the medical direction, they cover the day-to-day -day operations. So the medical director is, is taking this national scope of practice model they're taking all of the, the regulations and laws created by the state EMS office, and they're putting that to practice at that particular agency. Um, so we also have to think about the public uh, basic life support and immediate aid. Um, millions of lay people are trained to BLS and CPR, um, including teachers, coaches, child care providers. Um, so this is part of the EMS system, right? We have to work in coordination with uh, folks who are trained in CPR, because when we arrive, um, we hope that someone has already started helping that person if they happen to be in cardiac arrest. Automated external defibrillators are used by lay people every day, and we count on those folks. We count on those folks as a part of the EMS system. Emergency medical responders um, include law enforcement officers, firefighters. Again, this is emergency medical responders or EMRs. This is that very entry level to EMS. It's essentially a, a um, advanced first aid. Um, they initiate immediate care. They assist EMTs on their on on their arrival. Um, and then and then you could have um, good Samaritans. And, and when we talk about uh, uh, when we get into the legal chapter, we'll talk more about good Samaritan laws. Um, but you may have a good Samaritan that's also trained in first aid and CPR. They can provide valuable assistance. Um, uh, you know, with or without interfering with the options. So um, we have to work with them, you know, as, as a part of the EMS system. All right, so emergency medical technicians, again, that's the course that you're in currently. This course requires about 150 hours. The state requirements 150 hours in the state of Ohio. Um, the course that you're in, our course here is 176 hours. So we've increased the hours a little bit. Um, honestly, in my opinion, still low. Uh, I think get that number up to 200 um, you know there's a lot to talk about this is <laughs> as, you, as you probably know it's a very large large book 41 chapters to cover um, along with all of the skills based things that we need to cover um, the EMT is going to learn knowledge and skills to provide basic emergency care the EMT assumes responsibility for assessment care packaging and transport of the patient so this is the first level of EMS where you're actually going to assume responsibility for 
um, the patient for the patient care, the assessment, packaging, and transporting a patient to the hospital. Um, an EMR or emergency medical responder is not going to do all of that. They're going to provide that initial basic first aid care to someone. When an EMT arrives, the EMT is now eligible or responsible for the assessment, care, packaging, and transport of that patient to the hospital. Advanced emergency medical technicians, so the, the next level up um, from where you're being trained at here um, now, um, this training adds knowledge and skills um, in specific aspects of advanced life support including IV therapy, advanced airway adjuncts, administration of um, a limited number of medications. So advanced EMTs um, can start IVs, they can um, uh, perform some more advanced airway skills, and then there's a, a handful of medications that they're um, eligible to administer. And then at the higher level of uh, EMS pre-hospital care is paramedics. Um, paramedics, uh, require uh, to uh, excuse me to obtain your paramedic certification requires an extensive amount of training a um, thousand to thirteen hundred hours in the classroom and in internships and clinical settings um, so uh, you know very very extensive course um, this is um, uh, wide we're covering a wide range of ALS skills um, from from IVs to um, medication administration um, these are all uh, more advanced topics. All right, so um, there's 14 components of the EMS system that the book's going to cover here, and we're going to talk briefly about each of these components of the EMS system. So public access being the first component here that we're going to discuss. Um, 911 systems, uh, this is how uh, the public accesses our services um, through the 911 system. Someone calls 911, they speak with a dispatcher. The dispatcher obtains information and then dispatches the resources that are necessary. Emergency medical dispatch systems provide some medical instruction as well. So uh, some dispatchers, actually many dispatchers now, are considered emergency medical dispatchers which means that when they take a call for someone who's in cardiac arrest, and not only are they going to dispatch um, EMTs, paramedics, you know, whatever the necessary resources are, they're also going to talk to that person through um, CPR over the phone. Um, so they're able to uh, provide some recommendations to the person prior to, um, you know, EMS's arrival on the scene. Communication systems, uh, the dispatcher selects emergency system uh, to uh, component to activate. Um, EMS ranges from fire agencies to private services. I've already talked about that a little bit. Most of the agencies in the state of Ohio are fire-based. We, we have a lot of fi what I call fire-based or what they call fire-based EMS, which means uh, the EMS agencies are, are uh, grouped together with a fire department. Um, there are private ambulance companies, which are private services. There are EMS-only uh, agencies like Delaware County EMS. Um, new technology can help responders locate patients. Uh, we've got GPS on all of our trucks now. Um, GPS allows uh, the dispatcher to know where we're at, help us guide, you know, help guide us into the patients um, a little bit quicker, a little bit easier. Clinical care. Clinical care describes the pieces of equipment and the scope of practice, uh, familiarizes EMTs with their primary service area and the ambulance controls. So clinical care um, is um, that part of the EMS system is where we talk about the equipment that we're going to use and the scope of practice, what, which is what we can do as an EMT. That's what our scope of practice is. Human resources focuses on the people who deliver the care. They focus on the compensation, um, the interaction with other members of the medical community. Um, effort, efforts are underway to allow EMS providers to move from state to state. Um, and that's, that's something that can be done currently. Um, and that's part of the reason that we use the National Registry system for testing. Because National Registry is a national testing system. So if you're certified in the state of Ohio, it's possible for you to move to different states and maintain your EMT certification. There are some things that you have to do for that, uh, but that's something that human resources would be able to assist you with. All right, I already talked a little bit about medical direction, but um, just to add a few things to that, um, 
Physician medical directors authorize EMTs to provide medical care in the field. They provide standing orders and protocols. Standing orders and protocols are written documents that allow you as an EMT to do certain things on the scene without having to contact a medical director. So in the past, any time that you know, someone wanted to do something on the scene, an EMT, an EMS provider wanted to perform some sort of skill on the scene or provide some sort of medication, they had to call the medical director, call the, uh, the physician and say, hey, can I do this? Over time, we realized that that is um, not very efficient. And there was some more trust gained between the physicians and the EMTs. And this is why we work together as, as a system, because we've got this trust between us, between EMTs, paramedics, and, and these medical directors, these physicians. So physicians and medical directors decided to uh, start writing what we call standing orders. And what a standing order is, is describes an appropriate care based on a particular situation. And it establishes medical direction for providers. So when you arrive on the scene and, um, you know, the patient is having difficulty breathing, a standing order will allow you to administer oxygen to that patient without having to call the medical director and say, hey, can I give them oxygen? You have a standing order for that. Um, so it's an order from a physician that says, if you think a patient is having difficulty breathing and they need oxygen, you have the authority to give them oxygen. Now at the EMT level, there are still items that require you to contact medical control or a medical, uh, medical director for authorization. So something like nitroglycerin, or um, uh, albuterol inhalers that are in your in your medical kit. Certain things still require you to contact a, a, the medical director or medical control. Um, however, uh, as you move up in your career, as you become, you know, if you want to become an advanced EMT or a paramedic, a lot of those items, because you have additional training, no longer require authorization from the medical director and they become part of your standing orders. Medical director acts as the liaison between you and the hospital systems. Um, they help to, you know, alleviate any issues that may be, um, may be uh, you know, established there. Medical control can be offline or online. So two different types of medical control. Offline medical control, otherwise known as indirect medical control, that is those protocols, standing orders, training, supervision. Those are things where you don't have to directly discuss with the physician. The physician has written these procedures out, these standing orders out. That is what offline medical control is. Online or direct medical control is when a physician gives you directions over the phone or the radio. So you're on the scene of the, 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 emer the uh, emergency and you call a physician over the phone or over a radio and you say, this is what I have. I'd like to give them nitroglycerin do you approve? And that's when the physician gives that direction over the phone or the radio. And that's called online medical, medical control or medical direction. All right, legislation and regulation, um, training protocols and practices um, follow state legislation. We're going to talk about some of the state legislation here in the state of Ohio. There are certain things that are required of you as an, as an EMT, particularly in the trauma setting. We'll talk about all of that as we, as we move forward in the course. Um, but you'll understand that there are certain legislations and regulations from the state of Ohio that you have to follow as an EMT. Many times, um, senior EMS officials handle administrative tasks, scheduling, personnel budgets, purchasing, vehicle maintenance. Those are not things that you would be um, required to uh, perform coming up, you know, right out of uh, EMT school, um, you know, getting a job somewhere. Your primary focus at this point is going to be clinical care, care of the patients um, in the field. Integration of health services. Pre-hospital care is coordinated with hospital care. Uh, Pre-hospital care is continued in the emergency department. Um, so as you arrive at the emergency department, this, this, the care that you've provided to this patient is going to be continued on throughout the emergency department um, until that patient you know, is, is admitted into the hospital and taken up to a room. Um, integration ensures comprehensive continuity of care for the patient. So again, it's incredibly important for you to coordinate properly between your you and your hospitals the hospital that you arrive at they have to have that trust that you're you've um, you know uh, assessed and and, and uh, 
uh, treated this patient properly, and they're going to continue that treatment. Um, so it's a coordinated effort. EMS systems collaborate with hospitals to improve treatment for patients, heart attacks, trauma, strokes in particular. Um, all of these, uh, these three elements, these three um, uh, emergencies are, are you know, major uh, emergencies for these patients, heart attacks, traumas, uh, strokes, and they're specialized hospitals that handle these different types of uh, medical emergencies. So we coordinate and collaborate with those hospitals to ensure that if a patient is having a heart attack, the EMT recognizes that early, provides proper notification to the hospital in a timely manner, transports that patient to the hospital in a timely manner, and then the hospital is ready to receive and begin immediate treatment of that patient because of the, the, notif the pre-notification from EMS. So it's imperative as an EMT that we recognize these, uh, these patients and we give proper notifications with you know, good collaboration with the hospitals so that we provide the highest level of, of care to our patients. Mobile integrated healthcare. This is a um, a new method of delivering healthcare. It uses the the pre hospital spectrum, so it uses us as pre hospital providers to ensure that these patients are, um, you know, staying out of the hospital as much as possible uh, for un unneeded things. Right? I mean, it, it, none of us want to be in the hospital. No one wants to be sick and have to be in the hospital. So if we can try to prevent that by ensuring that a patient has their proper medications, that they have a way to, to you know, get their medications. They have a, uh, the, the proper ways to take their medications and they're, and they're following their doctor's orders. We might be able to prevent some of these folks from having to go to the hospital. And that's what mobile integrated healthcare is. So this is something we're kind of on the, on the leading edge of this here in, in EMS right now. You're starting to see this, <clears throat> excuse me, with more and more um, uh, EMS departments, fire departments, they're kind of starting to get into this mobile integrated healthcare. has uh, created additional training levels for EMS providers, including uh, community paramedicine or community paramedics. And those community paramedics are paramedics who receive some advanced training to provide services within a community. So not just going out when someone calls 911, um, but going out um, after, you know, someone's released from the hospital and just checking up on them, you know, making sure they have their proper medications, make sure they're following their doctor's orders. That's what a community paramedic does. All right, evaluation. So evaluation is a big part of being an, an EMS provider. Um, the medical director is responsible for maintaining quality control. So ultimately, it goes to the medical director. The medical director is the person who's responsible for saying, yes, all of the EMTs, all of the paramedics that are working under my command are maintaining a high level of, of you know, emergency care. That's, that's quality control, and that's the responsibility, ultimately, of the medical director. Now, in larger organizations, you know, Columbus Fire Department, for example, um, there's many pieces to this, right? The medical director isn't um, the only person who is, who is uh, responsible for those, um, a thousand, you know, those thousand EMS providers. Um, there's other supervisors in that chain of command, but the medical director is ultimately responsible for quality control. Um, continuous quality improvement reviews and audits the EMS system. Continu continuous quality improvement is a way to ensure that we are providing the highest level of care. Uh, refresher training or continuing education is important, and minimizing errors is the goal. So the goal is not to get someone in trouble. The goal is, is not punitive. This is not to, um, to find, uh, find out when you did something wrong on, a, on an EMS run and punish you for it. The goal is to recognize errors and train to prevent those errors from happening in the future. And that's the whole point of continuous quality improvement. It's not a punitive system. It's a system of, uh, hey, let's, let's all do better so that we can provide the best results for our patients. Um, information systems are used to efficiently <clears throat> excuse me, document the care that has been delivered. Most uh, EMS departments, fire departments now are using uh, computer-based software uh, for EMS reports. Um, so, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, everything was done on paper, paper reports, uh, carbon copy paper, you know, it was, it was, it was uh, you know, had some challenges, you know, to write out reports on paper. Now with computerized software, it's a lot easier to uh, document these cases, document the reports, and then transfer that information over to the hospital 
electronically. Um, finance systems vary uh, depending upon the organization. Um, types of organizations providing EMS transport across the 200 largest cities, you'll see that a uh, private organization has uh, edged out above fire department or fire-based EMS. Um, I would say in the state of Ohio, we're, we're uh, quite a bit different than that. We are, uh, majority of us are fire-based EMS. Uh, so the fire department provides the, the, the EMS transport services. However, there are some cities around, uh, cr certainly across the, the, the nation, where you've got a fire department and an EMS department that are, are completely separate. A private, private organization uh, um, maintains the, the EMS services. Personnel may be paid, volunteer, or a mix. Um, EMTs may be asked to gather insurance information, secure signatures, or obtain permission from patients to bill insurance. However, from a, a standpoint of, of the finances of the department, um, EMTs are not required to, um, to um, gather, you know, all of, or excuse me, to, to bill those patients specifically. This is something that, that is done by an EMS billing department, and most uh, EMS departments, fire departments around uh, the state of Ohio have a third-party um, company that handles all EMS billing. So EMTs may be asked to um, gather some information, but EMTs are not responsible for actually billing those, those patients. Education system. So education is a, uh, a big part of the EMS system. <clears throat> EMS instructors, instructors uh, particularly in the, in the state of Ohio, are licensed by the state of Ohio. So that's a certification that you can obtain. After obtaining your EMT certification, you, you can become an EMT instructor. Not anyone can be an EMT instructor. You have to go. You have to um, go to a forty-hour course. You've got to, uh, you know, pass another state uh, test. And you have to, have to um, you know, show that you're able to instruct um, EMTs. All the instructors that you're going to have in, in in class here are all certified state of Ohio certified EMS instructors. Uh, most EMS training programs uh, must adh adhere to the national standards, so, you know, we're included in that. We have to ensure that we're only training you to the national standard. Continuing education, refresher courses, um, computer-based or mannequin-based self-education exercises are all possibilities after you obtain your certification. So after you obtain your certification, just understand that you're going to be required to, to um, continue your education. You're going to be required to meet certain uh, levels of continuing education requirements. So depending on how far you go, if you become an, EMT, an advanced EMT, a paramedic, uh, so on and so forth, those levels increase as you go as you go forward in your career. Um, the, the point of this, uh, the point of continuing education is to keep you up to date with um, the most, uh, you know, the most current knowledge. Emergency medicine, medicine in general, it's a practice. And what that means when we say it's a practice is that uh, we're an evidence-based uh, industry. We, we try new things. We practice different things, and we research it and see what works. So things change. Not everything stays the same. This isn't an exact science. So as we, as we move forward, you're going to have continuing education because you may learn something new. Uh, we may learn something new as an EMS system, and we have to train everyone to that new uh, thought process. <clears throat> Excuse me. For example, a good example of this is uh, backboarding and spinal immobilization. We're on the cusp of a major, major paradigm shift uh, in EMS with, with uh, backboarding and spinal immobilization. In the past, if any patient, if we had any patient who had any uh, mechanism, mechanism of injury, <clears throat> so they got into a car accident, they fell, uh, whatever the case may be, we would throw them on a, a long backboard, which is a hard, firm board that they would lie onto, and we would strap them down to it and put them on the, on the cot and take them to the hospital. What we found now in, in, in um, the last you know, 10, 15 years was that um, just because someone has the mechanism of injury because they were involved in an auto accident doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be strapped down to a hard board. What they're finding is that might actually be hurting patients. That might be causing more problems. So the paradigm shift is going away from putting folks on these hard backboards to now putting them onto just simply our cot mattress because that mattress is able to essentially 
you know, hug the back of that patient, it's much more comfortable for them and it's causing a lot less injury, uh, spinal cord injury. So that's just one of those, um, you know, elements that uh, new research and, and new studies have shown that we need to change the way we're doing something. And that's, that's the point of continuing education and refresher courses as you move forward in your career. Um, advanced life support education. So when, you know, if you move forward past the EMT level, many instructors and directors there must hold four-year degrees. Um, and the training's typically provided in a college or adult career center or hospital settings. All right, another element of EMS, prevention and public education. Um, prevention and public education are two components of the EMS system that focus on public health. The emphasis is on prevention. Um, EMS works with public health agencies on primary prevention, secondary prevention. Uh, so this is where we would um, you know, create vaccination programs, um, seatbelt laws. That's something that was, was uh, uh, created through the EMS system. Pre-hospital EMS providers and trauma, trauma doctors are the ones that pushed for seatbelt laws, tobacco use laws, helmet laws. These are all prevention um, elements um, from, from public health. Um, so these are some different accomplishments that, that as an EMS system that we've, we've achieved to help prevent folks from, from uh, uh, being injured or, or illness. Research, as I was talking about a little earlier, this helps determine the shape of EMS. Again, we're an evidence-based practice. Um, we gather data. We make evidence-based decisions based on those on that research. And this changes. Again, it's evidence-based. So if, if the evidence changes, the research changes, we're going to change the way that we do things. All right, so let's talk about some roles and responsibilities of an EMT. Keep your vehicles and equipment ready at all times. You never know when the next 911 call is going to go out, so you have to ensure that your vehicle and your equipment is ready to go at all times. Ensure safety. Your safety is priority number one. If you're not able to help someone because you have um, endangered yourself somehow, um, then you're, you're not making the problem any better. You're making it worse. So your safety has to be priority number one. You have to think about yourself first, because if you're not there to help them, help someone, uh, then, then, you know, no one's going to be able to help them because they're going to have to be helping you as well. Uh, be familiar with your emergency vehicle operation. Uh, we're going to go over some of those elements um, uh, throughout the course. You're going to get to, you know, to go into a medic and, and, and see what a medic looks like and see how it operates. On-scene leadership, um, you know, when we arrive on scene, we're considered the experts. You need to be a leader on the scene. You need to, to be calling the shots. Scene evaluation, so you need to uh, recognize certain elements. If this is a hazmat type incident, if this is uh, something that's been caused out of violence, you know, that's all part of your scene evaluation and you have to recognize those things. Something like child abuse. You know, if you recognize something like child abuse and report that, um, that's all part of that scene evaluation. Calling for additional resources as needed. So you're going to have to um, be the person that determines whether or not you need more help. It's okay to call for help and there's certain... Uh, um, you know, certain responders that are that are required for certain incidents that you're going to that you're going to uh, be at. You know, for example, confined space, um, water emergencies where you've got someone who's you know potentially uh, drowning or something. You need a dive team, hazmat, hazard, hazardous materials, fire. You know, there's a lot of different types of uh, events that would require um, some additional resources. Gain patient access, so actually access uh, accessing the patient. Uh, or excuse me, accessing the patient. Um, so finding a way to get to the patient if they're um, if their door's locked and they can't make it to their door, you know, you're gonna have to figure out how to get into that person's house. Um, perform patient assessment. That's a big role uh, of an EMT. Determining what is wrong with that patient, and then treating them for that. Uh, give emergency medical care while awaiting those additional medical resources. So if this is the case that requires a higher level of care like ALS. Uh, like a paramedic, you're going to have to still provide them medical care while you're awaiting. We can't just call for a paramedic and leave. We've got to provide them with some initial basic life support prior to the arrival of the advanced uh, responder. Give emotional support. Um, you know, it's it's quite possible that, um, you know, that you're going to have to be an um, emotional support person for someone on the scene. If, uh, if, they've, if, a, if a patient's, uh, or excuse me, if a patient has... has uh, is found deceased, 
uh, you may have to, you know, provide some comfort and some care to, to family members around the scene. You may be the first person that's there to provide that emotional support. Maintain a continuity of care. So as you um, begin care, you need to continue that care throughout uh, to till the to the end result, which is you uh, transferring that care over to a, a higher level provider, such as a nurse or a physician in the hospital. Certainly going to resolve emergency incidences. Um, you're certainly going to uphold medical and legal standards, um, and you're going to ensure and protect patient privacy. We'll talk a lot more about patient privacy during the um, chapter over uh, legal responsibilities, um, but patient privacy is a big deal and it's um, governed by federal laws. You may have to give administrative uh, support, um, constantly continue professional development, so ensure that you are, are acting as a highest level professional and continuing um, your education in that regard. Um, cultivate and sustain community relations, so we are members of the community, and we're a vital member of the community, so establishing those good community relations is important. You're going to give back to the profession as well. So you're going to do something that's going to help this profession. Uh, this this career is, is a, a noble career and it's it's very worthwhile. So it's important for us to give back to the profession. So do something every day that um, that helps you know yourself and helps your coworkers. Um, it helps the profession in general. Some some really important professional attributes of an EMT. Integrity. You must maintain a high level of integrity. Um, people trust us. We go into someone's house on the worst day of their lives. They have to be able to trust us as EMTs. Um, you've got to you've got to be able to uh, to show that that you're empathetic, right? That you feel for that person. Um, you're self motivated. Um, you want you you want to be a doer. You want to fix things, right? You want to make things better. That's part of motivation. Appearance and hygiene, right? And that, that kind of goes back to your integrity and, and motivation to ensure that you have a, a, a maintain that level of, of appearance and, and, a, and a good level of hygiene. So I really require you in class to wear a uniform because it's important. It's important to not only know what you're doing, but to look like you know what you're doing. Um, and that involves self-confidence as well. Be confident in the job that you're doing. Time management is important. Um, we always say in, in fire and EMS, the only way to get fired is to be late uh, because time is so important, right? If you don't show up on work, if you don't show up to work, who is going to be there uh, when someone needs when someone needs you? So it's it's incredibly important time management. Uh, be to work on time and 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 manage that time appropriately. Uh, communications. We're working with with uh, different professionals, you know, throughout your day, throughout your career. You need to ensure that you're able to communicate. Teamwork. This job is all about teamwork. Uh, teamwork is incredibly important because uh, without our, our teammates, without our coworkers and our teammates, we can't do this by ourselves. So we've got to work together and teamwork is important. Uh, certainly respect uh, patient advocacy. So be that patient's advo uh, advocate. If you think the patient needs a certain level of care, you need to advocate for that. If you arrive at the hospital and you know you think the patient needs um, some sort of additional care that you can, you haven't provided yet or you can't provide, you need to ensure to advocate for that patient. Tell the physician what you think. Um, careful delivery of care, certainly um, delivering care, um, not only carefully, but the appropriate care is important. Every patient's entitled to compassion, respect, and the best care possible. Every single patient. It doesn't matter um, who that patient is. It doesn't matter how old they are. It doesn't matter what what they may have done to get into the situation that they're in. It doesn't matter. They're still entitled to compassion, respect, and the best possible care we can provide for. Uh, EMTs are bound by patient confidentiality, and this is what I was talking about with the federal law, the um, HIPAA, uh, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Um, this is something that we're going to discuss uh, a lot further uh, over, uh, during the legal chapter. Um, but this is important for you to know that uh, HIPAA laws um, require you to keep their their personal information confidential. All right, so we've got a handful of review questions that we're going to go through here. Um, which of the following is an example of care that is provided using standing orders? If you, if you would, uh, go ahead and pause your video now, read through those selections, and I'll give you the answer here uh, shortly. All right, so for number one, 
The answer is B. The EMT defibrillates a patient in cardiac arrest, begins CPR, and then contacts medical control. So standing orders are a form of offline or indirect medical control, meaning that you don't have to actually speak with the medical control physician to perform certain skills. Those skills are, are certain life-saving interventions like CPR, defibrillation, bleeding control. You don't have to contact the physician prior to doing those particular skills. So uh, A is incorrect here because medical control contacted uh, by the EMT after a patient with chest pain refuses EMS care. This is an example of online medical control. <clears throat> um, a physician gives the EMT um, an order via radio to administer oral glucose. Again, that's an example of online medical control given over the phone or the radio. Uh, following an overdose, the EMT contacts the medical director for, for permission to give activated charcoal. Again, online medical control. You're actually calling the medical control physician and asking for um, you know, permission or guidance to give a certain medication. Number two, quality control in an EMS system is the ultimate responsibility of of the paramedic, the lead EMT, the medical director, or the EMS administrator? And the answer here for number two is C, the medical director. Ultimately, the medical director is responsible for quality control. Number three, upon arriving at the scene of a domestic dispute, you hear yelling and the sound of breaking glass from inside the residence. So the following should you do, immediately gain access to the patient, carefully enter the house and then call the police, retreat to a safe place until the police arrive, or tell the patient to exit the residence so that you can provide care. And the answer here to number three is C, retreat to a safe place until the police arrive. You should not put yourself in harm's way uh, because again, your safety has to be priority number one. As EMTs, we do not have the skills or equipment to, to protect ourselves, to defend ourselves. That is what the police are for. So in this particular case, if you hear yelling, you hear sounds of breaking glass, you're concerned for your own safety, the best thing to do is to retreat, call the police, and wait until the police arrive. All right, number four. Which of the following is not a component of continuous quality improvement? Which of the following is not a component of continuous quality improvement? You can go ahead and pause the video and read through those selections. And the answer for number four, which of the following is not a component of continuous quality improvement, is C, negative feedback given to those who make mistakes while on a call. The purpose of continuous quality improvement is to ensure that the standard of care is provided on all calls. This involves periodic run reviews, discussing needs for improvement, and providing training um, post-run, after the run. Uh, positive feedback should be provided during this process. So that, again, this is a positive process, not a negative process. It's not punitive. This is not to get someone in trouble. This is simply to do better. Uh, so we, we're going to provide some remedial training. We're going to discuss needs for improvement but we're not going to provide negative feedback to someone. All right, number five. All of the following are responsibilities of the EMS medical director, except, and you can go ahead and pause the video, read through those. And the answer for number five, all of the following are responsibilities of the EMS medical director, except A, evaluating the uh, patient insurance information. So all of the following are responsibilities of the EMS medical director except evaluating patient insurance information. Um, responsibility of the medical director includes serving as a liaison, ensuring that appropriate standards are met, ensuring the appropriate EMT education and continuing uh, training. Insurance matters are handled by uh, the EMS billing department. And as I talked about earlier, generally that's a third party company that deals with EMS billing. Number six, which of the following should be the EMT's highest priority? A, controlling severe, severe bleeding. B, maintaining a patient's airway. C, ensuring patient safety. Or D, ensuring personal safety. The correct answer here for number six, while these are all very high priorities, the highest of the priorities is D, 
ensuring personal safety. Because again, you can't perform A, B, or C without ensuring that you're, you're safe yourself. So that's the, the highest priority. The first priority is ensuring your own personal safety. All right, and our last review question, number seven, which of the following is a professional responsibility of the EMT? You can go ahead and pause the video there and read through those options. And the answer for number seven, which of the following is a professional responsibility of the EMT, is C, maintaining a professional demeanor in even the most stressful situations. Uh, because the public relies upon the EMT to remain calm when others cannot, he or she must project a professional and calm demeanor even when under extreme stress. And that wraps up chapter one, EMS systems.